I told Travis I'd put in a plug for the William Miller Chapel. That's one of our uh, duties in our home church is to take care of this chapel and, and give him a hand. We are going to have William Miller weekend like we do every weekend. It's like a camp meeting. People from all over the country come. Hopefully this year will be no different. So if you're up and around New York, July 31st, stop in and see us at the William Miller Chapel, which is in Lowhampton near Whitehall, New York, on the Vermont border. Beautiful place. And uh, I just told him I'd, I'd mention that just in case anybody's traveling that, that uh, area. Today, uh, we'd like to talk about uh, what is the goal? What really is the goal? Athletes have a goal. They have a goal of the, the championship, and musicians have a goal of maybe playing at the, these great venues. So what is your goal? What is our goal? Uh, you have goals of people that are wealth. They have fame. They have fortune, the movie stars, the ball players, and all of this stuff. And they all seem to gravitate towards what they want. It reminds me of a story of this uh, This young man was a student at one of these prestigious colleges. And he was an atheist, very brilliant. And he had a friend who was a committed Christian. And this friend always preached to him, talking about the Lord and was very, very uh, vocal about his beliefs. And this atheist friends tolerated him, but he didn't pay much attention because he figured he was smarter than everybody else, so he didn't need anything. And this friend had a goal of being an Olympic diver, and he was very good. So one night he decided to go to the pool and do some practicing after everybody was asleep about 2 o'clock in the morning. So he goes into the gym and all the lights were off, but there was a big skylight over the pool. And he could see because the moon was bright. And as he went up these ladders to the highest place you can dive, and he turned around, you know how they do, and they get on their toes and they spread their arms out. And as he spread his arms out, he looked at the reflection from that pool, and he saw, this is what he saw. So right there, that changed his life. And he went forward and got on his knees and accepted the Lord. As he got up, a janitor to come in, turned on the lights, and he had all his tools with him. And as he looked over his shoulder, he was there to, repool the, to repair the pool. And the pool was drained. There wasn't a drop of water in that pool. So what is the goal for a Christian? Is the goal for a Christian to go to heaven, simply? I would think not. To go to heaven actually is a, is a great goal. There's no question, but it's not the goal. In Exodus 32, 31, after the people of uh, Israel, the children of Israel made the golden calf, and the Lord was extremely displeased, and he told Moses he was going to annihilate these people and start all over again. He, he's had it with these people. And Moses said to him in Exodus thirty-two thirty-one. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of the book which you have written. Why do you think Moses took on the guilt of everybody so they could be saved and he was lost? That's the choice he made. Save my people and let me perish. We have several kind of love in the, in the Bible. Agape love is what they're talking about. Love someone without regard of what it's going to do for you. Unconditional love. In Romans 9.3, Paul says the same thing. He would trade with his brethren so that they could be saved and he would accept the loss. In Matthew 27, 50, when Jesus was on the cross and he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He gave up his life for the life of others. So I think that Christians should not make eternal life their priority. They should make Jesus Christ their priority. 
You know, when we were getting married 57 years ago, my wife and, and I uh, decided uh, we would tie the knot, so to speak. And she had a car, she had a Plymouth. And it was a white and yellow Plymouth. Pretty nice car. I had a Morris Minor. Ever see, ever hear one of those Morris Miners? It's a little itty bitty car made in England. And uh, it was just a piece of junk, but that was my car. Now, do you think I married Carol? Because when you get married, you have whatever she has is mine and whatever I have is hers. So here's the question, did I marry her for the car? I think the analogy there is you don't measure, you don't, the goal is not the eternal life. That's why you accept Christ. The goal is Christ. That's why you have, I think we got things backwards a little bit. Not all of us, but some. So the car came with the package. The car came with Carol. But Carol was the prize, not the car. So eternal life comes with Jesus, and it comes with the life you have with him. The goal is not eternal life. The goal is Jesus. I heard this quote. It says, I am a Christian because a man named Jesus and the trust I have in him, not what he can give me. The gift is the byproduct of his love. There's a scientist by the name of Jim Tours. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. He is a... Uh, he has a PhD in chemistry. He is a, uh, has a, a professorship at Rice University, and he, is the, he holds 175 patents on nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is technology in which they take the smallest parts of the atom and they split it and they use it to do marvelous things, like spinal cord recovery and making things cheaper for people to buy. Brilliant, brilliant man. This is what Jim Torres said. Let me go ahead here a little bit. And he said, Jesus is everything to me. Here is a man who is absolutely brilliant. One of the top 50 scientists in the whole world. Very well respected. And to him, Christ is everything. He has a website that he talks individually to people that are looking for Christ to share his faith. I just thought it was amazing that a man of that intellect can accept who Christ is. By the way, he's a Messianic Jew. So we're gonna take a look at a couple stories in the Bible about goals and wealth and all that stuff. So if we go to Luke 18, 18, Luke 18, 18. I have to do it the old-fashioned way by looking it up in the Bible. I'm not a, uh, like Frank, I'm not very adept at doing things on the screen. So Luke 18, 18. And it says, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he says, good teacher. Why did he say good teacher? Because that was a um, saying of respect. And was Jesus a teacher? Yes, he was a teacher. Good teacher. What can I do to have eternal life? So what did he want? To, what question did he want answered? How do I get eternal life? That was the question posed to the teacher. I have this question. How do I get eternal life to Jesus, the good teacher? 19. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but that, that is God. Only one is good, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not, do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Those are the latter part of the commandments, starting with verse 6, or commandments 6, 7, 8, and 9. That's what those commandments are. Then he, go, instead of going to 10, Jesus goes back to five and he says, honor thy father and thy mother. Why did he do that? 
Why didn't he just keep right on going? Everybody knows the Ten Commandments and the order. Why didn't he keep on going? I think he kept on going because he knew what this ruler, what his need was, what his problem was. It wasn't any of the ones he mentioned. Because in the next verse, and he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. I've done all of these things ever since I was a child. I go to, I go to synagogue. I worship the Lord. I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't cheat. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Jesus knew that the 10th commandment, which is thou shalt not covet, was his problem. And then he said, after you take care of that problem, follow me. That's exactly what he said to the disciples. So Jesus was inviting him to be a disciple of his. Come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, sorrowful he said, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Was the problem here rich, riches that the man had? Or was it more than that? I was listening to David Asherick and he was talking about wealth. We in this country are so blessed, even with all the problems and issues that we have. Did you know, which I didn't know, this is amazing, if you own one pair of shoes, one pair, you are richer than 60% of the world's population. One pair of shoes. If you own two pair of shoes, you are richer than 30% of the world's population. And we complain. Think of that. And we complain. So the problem is not the richest. The problem is what you hold on to. What is your priority? Is your priority the Christ who gave his life for you? Is your priority your stuff? Or whatever it may be. It may not be your stuff, it may be something else. As long as you hold on to something, more than you hold on to the Lord, you're gonna have issues. So we have three questions. Let's take the rich ruler. We're going to ask, what, the, what, the, what was the reason he talked to Jesus? What was the response he had? And what the result was? Now, the reason he went to Jesus was because he wanted eternal life. That was the reason, right? Didn't he say that? What can I do to, to, to have eternal life? And the response was what? When he found out, the response was sorrow. He was sorrowful. And what was the result? He lost his salvation. That was a result. He was not willing to give up what he could not keep anyway for forever in exchange for the love that the Christ has provided for him. He wanted eternal life and was sorrowful when he found out that he could the cost and he lost Jesus. And when you lose Jesus, you lose the whole package. You lose everything that goes with it. We'll continue Luke 19, 1. This is the story about Zacchaeus. 19, 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a rich man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was very rich. He sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. That reminds me, uh, he couldn't see the crowd because either the people around him were taller or he was shorter than everybody else, one or the other. But he couldn't see because they were in the way. It reminds me of the story of the paralytic when his friends tried to get him into the house to see Jesus. And all the people were crowded around the house and this paralytic could not get in because the people were in the way. So they had to go upstairs, break through the roof and lower him down. 
Do you think the people, I, th I think, the people that were in his way were members of the church. They were there to see Jesus. Do sometimes we get in the way of people's walk with Christ because we have these ideas that we should be first and we are the most important instead of them? Didn't Christ say, love me and love your neighbor? Isn't that what the, the, the great commandment is? Love the Lord with all your heart and love others as yourself? So I think there's more to more to the idea of eternal life than eternal life itself. So Zacchaeus went up in, up in a tree to see Jesus. He sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. So he knew Jesus was coming, so he got up in this tree so he could see him. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, how did he know his name? Never introduced to this guy. Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay in your house. So he gave Zacchaeus the inv invocation, inv invitation. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they, the church, saw it, they complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest who man, who's this man who is a sinner. Evidently, they haven't looked in the mirror lately. Because the last I checked, we were all sinners. But some people are so quick to point at others because they have a sin that may be obvious, but they don't see themselves. I think we're all like that to some degree. I know I am. Then Zacchaeus stood and said, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. I'm going to pay back four times anybody I have wronged. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. So let's go to our three things, the, re the reason, the response, and the result. The reason was he wanted the man and not what he could give him. He climbed up in the tree. He wanted to see Jesus. He didn't want to see what he had with him. He wanted to see him, find out what he was about. The response was when Jesus said, I must spend time in your house, he received him joyfully as opposed to the rich young ruler who received the news sorrowfully. And the result was, as Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. So his motivation, which is extremely important in life, why you do what you do, is to see Jesus, to know Jesus, Amen. to learn from Jesus. The rich ruler called Jesus good teacher. What did Zacchaeus call him? Call him Lord. The rich young ruler treated Jesus as a smart guy. Zacchaeus treated him as his king, as his Lord. So when Jesus wants to come into your house, do you receive him joyfully? Because if you do, you will get him and the whole package that goes with him. I'd like to close with a, a story. And I don't usually do this, but I, I have to read this because every time I tell the story, I always forget something. And in my advanced age, that's becoming a regular occurrence. Now, some of you may have heard this, but it's poignant for what we're talking about today. And it goes like this. It's by a guy named Woodrow Kroll. Ever heard anybody here Woodrow Kroll? He's an evangelist. A wealthy man and his son loved to collect rare works of art. They had everything in their collection from Picasso to Raphael. They would often sit together and admire the great works of art. When the Vietnam conflict broke out, the son went to war. He was very courageous and died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was horrified and grieved deeply for his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock at the door. 
a young man stood at the door with a large package in his hands. He said, Sir, you don't know me, but I'm the soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day, and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart, and he died instantly. He often talked about you and your love for art. The young man held out his package. I know this isn't much. I'm not really a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. The father opened the package. It was a portrait of his son painted by the young man. He stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in the painting. The father was so drawn to the eyes that his own eyes welled up with tears. He thanked the young man and offered to pay him for the picture. Oh no, sir, I can never repay what your son did for me. It's a gift. The father hung the portrait over the mantel. Every time visitors came to his house, he took them to see the portrait of his son before he showed them any other of the great works he had collected. The man died a few months later. There was to be a great auction of his paintings. Many influential people gathered, excited over seeing the great paintings and having an opportunity to purchase one for their collection. On the platform sat the painting of his son. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. We will start the bidding with this picture of the sun. Who will bid for his picture? There was silence. Then a voice in the back room shouted, we want to see the famous painting, skip this one. But the auctioneer persisted. Will someone bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? 100, 200? Another voice shouted angrily, we didn't come to see this painting. We came to see the Van Goghs, the Rembrandts. Get on with the real bids. But still the auctioneer continued. The sun. Who'll take the sun? Finally, a voice came from the very back of the room. It was a longtime gardener of the man and his son. I'll give $10 for the painting. Being a poor man, it was all he could afford. We have $10. Who will bid 20 Give it to him for $10. Let's see the masters. 10 is the bid. Will someone bid 20 The crowd was becoming angry. They didn't want the picture of the sun. They wanted the more worthy investments for their collections. The auctioneer pounded a gavel. Going once, going twice, sold for $10. The man sitting in the second row shouted, Now, let's get on with this collection. The auctioneer laid down his gavel. I'm sorry, the auction is over. What about the paintings? I'm sorry. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal that stipulation until this time. Only the painting of the sun would be auctioned. Whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate, including the paintings. The the man who took the sun gets everything. When we take the sun, we get everything. We have a closing song.